evening. Good evening and welcome to the May. Meeting May. Crazy May. May of the uh, Granville Exemption Old School District. Thank you all for being here. Would you please rise and join us in the pledge of allegiance? To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Many of you have other events that you have to get to, so we have a couple of requests to get people in and out quickly. Um, so I'm going to spend about five hours talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'd like to first recognize the Granville Middle School Science Olympiad team for qualifying for the state tournament at the end of April and finishing 15th out of 40 teams. Would the members of the Science Olympiad team please come forward? And I will recognize you. <laughs> Winning medals were Luke Hahn and Wyatt Malashenko with third place in the state with the battery buggy, right? Battery buggy? Okay. Uh, Matthew Bolton and Luke Hahn with fifth place in the state in Game On. You'll have to ask them what those are. <laughs> Just missing medals were Luke Hahn and Malcolm McCarthy with a seventh place uh, finish with the Elastic Launch Glider. Is that right? Okay. Marie Weiss and Cassidy Perderi with an eighth place uh, finish in the Disease Detectives. And Malcolm McCarthy and Quinn McCarthy with a ninth place uh, finish with Road, as in R-O-A-D, Scholar. Uh, congratulations to all of you. Presented Granville in a well in the All Ohio show. True tried out and was cast, and David and Claire both applied for and received technical leadership positions. David was in charge of props and Claire the costumes. And last, Granville earned the Honor True Award for all the, uh, all the things we are doing with our theater parks. Uh, drama students, please come up and be recognized uh, when I call your name. 
David Braden, Olivia Belvin, Rose Duffus, Claire Duncan, Truchin Parker, Alex Hare, Nick Havel, Katie Noth, Hannah Roach, and CJ Travis. And uh, Sarah, would you like to come up and join them? It is truly amazing. Uh, what our kids do on stage is absolutely phenomenal. It's in large part because of Sarah and her team and what they do. And I would encourage you to attend as many performances as you can. So um, I'm actually delaying a little bit of this. So I'm going to actually recognize Mr. Sobel. Um, so, if you've never seen an obtuse picture, <laughs> that is the most obtuse picture I've ever seen of an individual. So, at this time, I'd like to recognize our district treasurer, Mike Sobel, for his meticulous reporting and scope of knowledge he has brought to our district um, during his time with us. As you may know, Mike has been the treasurer for Granville School since 2009. His last day will be May 31st. Recently, he was presented with the 2019 Chuck Gossett Legislative Advocacy Award at the Ohio Association of School Business Officials Conference in Columbus. Um, we would like to recognize Mike for his, this award or his, that award and officially congratulate him on his uh, retirement. It's been kind of like a roast for the last three weeks for Mike. So, and this is the, this is the first of probably four showings. Uh, we have a game plan for pin the tail on Mike. Uh, but I'd like to invite uh, Representative Scott Ryan up to the podium to also share some, some comments. Thanks, Jeff. Um, what I have here is a proclamation from the General Assembly uh, recognizing your receiving the Gossett Award for Legislative Achievement, and I will not read it, I promise. <laughs> but I did want to recognize that, and so it's signed by myself and uh, Representative Lightbody in the residential district and the speaker. Um, but personally, I would uh, even more importantly like to thank you for your tireless efforts to keep me informed. And uh, over the last two years, if you don't know, um, almost two years. Um, <laughs> it seems like five. I have not, been in, I have not put, put in nearly the hours that Mr. Sobel has, but I was involved in a, in a joint uh, project to try and uh, revamp how we do school funding in the state of Ohio. And we're still at it. I was uh, making calls at 11 o'clock one night this week. Still, we have, uh, it's now a standalone bill because I wasn't ready for the budget. And some people don't have to ready for the budget, I'll put it that way. Um, so we have over 50 co-sponsors, so we have a majority of the House now on board with this new school funding plan, which I am very passionate about. What uh, truly due to this man right here is, is why I felt the confidence to have the knowledge to uh, help get behind this. He put in tireless hours to help this, and I just want to personally thank you for your engagement and uh, making me a much better informed legislator. So thank you. Thank you. And you know what the de Department of Taxation is like. They put you in a closet and they make you crunch numbers all day long. 
So after the, the, his eyes acclimated to the sunlight, <laughs> um, he joined us here in Granville. And um, I started in 2011, just prior to Mike's um, arrival. And, and I have to say that it has been a fantastic partnership from my end. Um, not only did I learn a tremendous amount about school funding, and I already thought I knew a lot, I didn't know anything. And, um, but I also learned a little bit more about how to influence large-scale policy. And um, Mike has shared that knowledge with his uh, AP government um, class. And so students that take that course uh, have the opportunity to get passionate about a, a specific uh, bill that is going through either the General Assembly right now or they would like to propose. And they have to go through testimony. And um, Alexander uh, participated in that today. Um, it's a rigorous process. We have some legislators that are a, a part of that. We have some board members that have been a part of that. And uh, it's one of the opportunities that we try and uh, build the capacity of our students to understand how to influence legislation and influence legislation in a positive manner. So um, it's very rare to have a person that's as technically sound as Mike, but it's even more rare to have a person who wants to engage in the educational process as a treasurer. And so he got his sub-license. Um, we don't pay him. Um, so, but it was, it, it spoke from my perspective um, to Mike's character as far as what he believed in as, as far as public education. So I know I'm going to miss him. Brittany is going to be taking his shoes here soon. Um, we're going to keep the picture. <laughs> so, Better you than me. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yes, yeah, there you go. Um, but it's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's Thank been a pleasure. You. our student reporter for board meetings, Kristen Zanel, who has been exceptional in her reporting of items of interest and things that were taking place at the high school uh, throughout the year. This is a, something that we started two years ago at the board, um, having a student representative come and talk a little bit about what's going on. And uh, Kristen has done it with a, a, a little bit of a zest for life, I think is the way I would characterize it. She's in, infused a little bit of humor, a little bit of sarcasm, a few uh, solid talking points of things that might want to be changed. Um, but we really have appreciated her dedication to this at all throughout this entire year. So I'd like you to be recognized. And then if you'd like to give your final report, you can. <laughs> But I know you're a senior, so I want to make sure that mom and dad are okay with it, because you never know when you give a senior a mic what can happen. <laughs>
school board and the decisions that you all make um, on a monthly basis. And so I want to thank you all, and um, I'll see you all at graduation. <laughs>
Can you start playing Earth, Wind, and Fire? I was like, all right, I can get into this. So, congratulations. Thank you. And now, choir. Uh, presidents for Symphonic Choir, Cindy Flora, Anna Dunham, Nick Havel, and Jim Beatty. Uh, presidents of Women's Chorus, uh, Olivia um, Mackenzie, Hannah Rockwell, President of Men's Chorus, Charlie Tell, President of Freshman Women's Chorus, Ali Hussey, and All State Choir, McKenna Furman, and Director, Christian. And this is going to conclude our commendation, but Jared, if, if there's anybody that I missed from Blue Steel, um, just let them know that we'll get their uh, certificates to them. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In true fashion, I'm yielding to Brittany. <laughs> <laughs> And then, of course, that obviously has a positive impact on our cash balance as well. So that is positive through the life of the forecast. Um, obviously due in part to the passage of the income tax, as well as some of the budget reductions that were made um, before the levy. Mike added the smiley face. That was <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what I wanted to note on this slide um, is the biggest difference is in property tax revenue, which is down compared um, to the October forecast. But this is because of the inside millage swap that took place that was not in the forecast in October. 
but because of the income tax levy passage, um, we did the, the um, inside millage swap. So that's why you see a slight reduction compared to October in real estate. Um, and then also just to note that the, the um, permanent improvement levy, as well as the second component of the inside millage swap will take place effective January 1st, 2020. I know there's been a lot of questions in the community about that, so we wanted to point that out. Um, and then the smiley face is, of course, due to the income tax. We received our first payment um, in April, so we have that included in the forecast now that we didn't in October. Brittany, can you talk a little bit about the phasing of that income tax as far as, you know, it, it might take two to two and a half years to fully face it? Yeah, so what we included in our exceptions for the income tax is actually based on uh, kind of a timeline that the Department of Taxation has out there. Um, and because of the timing and when income taxes are due, you don't actually see the full impact for a full year um, until fiscal year 2021. So this phases in through all of next fiscal year into the next before we see that full effect. So those payments are made quarterly. That's why, we've, why we only will see one this fiscal year. We'll have all four next fiscal year, but they won't be the full amount until that following year. All right, our next slide looks at our monthly cash flow. So this only goes out through fiscal year 2020, but what we wanted to point out is that we, in January of this fiscal year, which is the red arrow, we were below our um, cash balance benchmark. And typically um, that happened because of the timing of when we receive our real estate payments. So January is typically our lowest month in terms of cash balance. Um, that will, of course, go away. You can see we're above that green line all the way out through 2020, um, partially because of the, the timing of those income tax payments. We receive, we'll receive one in January going forward. Um, so that kind of levels out our cash flow um, from month to month. This is just a look at our projected enrollment and kind of what we use as the basis for our assumptions. And what I wanted to point out is that you see all the way out the far right side, um, we're projecting in 2023 to be above our highest point, which was in 2010. So we're actually projecting based on a five year historical average to exceed that um, most recent high point in our enrollment. Do we have a sense yet of how that translates into, and I know it would be different because it will be spread evenly in classes, but how that translates into our use of the physical facilities and buildings themselves? Yeah, I think when you, would you like me to answer? Yeah, please. Okay, all right. Uh, so when you look out in, when we're, our enrollment creeps up to 2,600, um, our most challenged building will be the elementary a lot of the growth has been happening at the elementary level. Um, there are still some spaces that have been used for uh, certain purposes that might be repurposed to be classroom spaces, and you might have to put some people in traveling situations. Um, but we will start to run into more challenges from a facility asset standpoint. Or, yeah, asset standpoint. Um, probably not in this fiscal or five-year forecast, but definitely in the next 10. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go through the expenditure and revenue parts of the, the budget. Um, overall, we're going to start with expense. This is backwards from how we normally do it. Okay, I need to kill myself. This is backwards. Normally, we do revenue to expenditure. We're doing it the other way to kind of tee up the discussion we're going to have um, over state funding um, as part of the board discussion. Um, what you can see with our expenditures is that salaries are actually a slightly declining area, and it's not that salaries aren't growing. It is unfortunately that benefits and purchase services are growing faster than salaries um, benefits because of the um, prop or the, the health insurance. What you can see in 2019 compared to 16 
is the impact of the change in health care benefits that we did in the current um, collective bargaining agreement, where they had been 27% of spending um, in 2016, it's down to 24% now because of the changes um, that we undertook to try and control our costs. Um, we're hoping it that has longer term impacts. You know, we're still too early in the process to, to be able to tell how you know, how that may happen going forward. Um, purchase services, and what we're really dealing with there are really it's students being educated outside of the district. Um, we have had increasing costs for a number of years now um, from students either being educated at the Educational Service Center, um, taking John Peterson or Autism Scholarships to go to a private provider of enrolling into another district or going to an online school. Um, those are the main drivers of purchase services along with the contract um, that we have to do maintenance and grounds. Um, and, and so that has been growing. The other pieces of the spending are just very minor. Mike, so when you say uh, students uh, enrolling elsewhere based on the state scholarship, can you give me a kind of typical number, like the number of students and the economics of kind of per student, how much we receive and pay out for those various scholarships um, and so forth? If you're talking about a John Peterson scholarship, um, you know, we get an allocation of a couple thousand dollars for each of those kids. And for most of the John Peterson students, um, the subtraction is 10,000. So the state gives us 2,000, we lose 10,000 to the, the school where they're going. The autism scholarships, um, we get a little more because the students are autistic. Um, but um, generally, we probably get you know, maybe about six or $7,000 for them. And the subtraction for most of them is 26,000. So if someone takes an autism scholarship and say, goes to Marlboro Academy, which is where a lot of our autism students go to. Um, again, we may get six, seven, maybe even $9,000 for them, but the, the subtraction for the scholarship is 26,000 that is then sent to Marlboro. Um, so we lose 15 to $20,000. Far more than we collect in local taxes in. Correct, it's far more than we collect in local taxes. For students going to community schools, or open enrolling to a, another public district. Generally, we get about $2,000 for each of those students from the state, and the subtraction is just over $6,000 for what's given to the provider. And what kind of is our number of students or enrollment? Is it that a number of students change, or is it a cost change that's driving this significant increase in the purchase services? It's primarily a number of students change. Um, the number of students taking Peterson and Autism Scholarships has gone up drastically over the last five years. Um, we, for some reason, we have a pretty big uptick this year of students open enrolling um, into other public school districts. Those are really the two biggest um, sources of the increase that we've seen this year over, over last year. Our numbers going to community schools have stayed, have stayed pretty flat. Um, only about 10 or 15 students, and those are primarily going to online schools um, that they're going to. How much is sort of driven by, I'll call it true need that's not able to be served here, and I want to do, make sure we all do the right thing for all the students, and how much is driven by choice <coughs> based on other decisions that the family makes? Like I, that's probably a better question for Mr. Brown. Yeah, well. I, I think, first of all, it's an individual equation. Yeah, it, there's not a universal standard response. However, um, a couple of things have driven the decisions. One, more uh, schools or uh, private groups have become scholarship providers, so there's more access. Um, many of the times, people don't even, they enroll here and then they, they never step through our doors. They're already going to something uh, another provider, so we don't even have the option to educate them initially. <coughs> so, um, and then some are just familial situations that um, are related to open enrollment and you know, yeah, things like that. Maybe so. Yeah. I'm taking a look at the five years moving forward. 
Um, the ones you see in this fiscal year, fiscal 19, you see the impacts of a combination of the um, spending reductions that we did last May for this year, as well as the second half of the year impact of the health insurance change where you see um, our salary spending is about flat this year with last year despite our staff getting a 2% raise. Um, you'll see that benefits, our benefit costs are down about 6%. Um, that's from a combination of the lost positions and the lower premium costs because of the change in our health insurance. Um, purchase services actually has slowed from a primary growth has been about four and a half percent this year compared to almost a eight per, or over seven percent average the last five years. Um, we are expecting that to um, at least be creeping up, if not faster, um, going forward. Though. Um, nothing else is real significant. You see very big changes in percentage changes in capital, uh, but what that really is is a change from like twelve thousand dollars to eighteen. So there's almost no money. We we budget a small about thirty thousand dollars every year to cover incidental capital, mostly small stuff that may happen in the buildings, having to replace things um, that we weren't accounting on. I think last year we spent 8,000 of the, of the 30,000 this year, I think we're spending about 12,000, and there, there you have a 40% increase, is going from eight to $12,000 of spending. Um, you see the big drop this year in our debt payments um, that last year was the final year of our old house school 64 project and the first year of the lease purchase um, for the energy project that we undertook last year. And so the, in fiscal 18, those numbers were inflated because of the overlap. Um, that's gone down, so now all we have is part of the lease purchase payments um, that are part of that. Um, if you take a look at other expenditures, um, these are things that we have included in the five-year forecast based on the recommendations of uh, Mr. Brown. Um, we are adding back two full-time aides, one in each of the two libraries where we lost the librarians because of the budget reductions before this school year. Um, in addition, that we are going to undertake a long-term study to look at the best uses for those space and how, how to best utilize those positions moving forward. Um, we have two teacher teaching positions allocated to address enrollment. Um, one of those has been filled, um, and that is in second grade. Um, the other position, we are, not, we are not quite sure if or where we need it. A lot of that will depend on kind of our enrollment over the summer, um, but likely it's, it's going to be in either fourth or sixth grade or potentially someone who can fill positions in both um, because we're running into class size problems in both those grades. Um, third thing that is in here is a re reconfiguration of the art program at the high school. Um, Mrs. Kinsley, who's a CTEC teacher, has retired. Um, and so we're bringing that program in house and we've gotten CTEC certification for those programs, which we would hope would generate additional revenues. Unfortunately, under the um, version of the budget that was passed by the House, um, we can get no additional revenue for that program right now because everything is frozen at 2019 levels. Um, we hope that changes between now and the time that the budget is enacted at the end of next month. Um, but right now, the money that that we are, we're counting on, we are not able to count on right now, as the budget is right now. And then finally, we are adding one front office aid in the high school, uh, primarily to address um, house school 410 and the calling requirements, um, and also to address student safety to make sure that there is, you know, someone at that position who is able to monitor the door and the hallways. Um, Changes that we are not recommending for right now um, for the 1920 school year. Um, there is no reinstatement of the communications position that was eliminated. Um, no reinstatement of an assistant principal split between GES and GIS. And at this point, no librarians um, replacing the two positions that were eliminated. So none of those are funded right now um, in the budget. One thing that I would call the board's attention to is um, 
as the enrollment continues to grow, K-6, um, you know, Travis is the principal of a building that has 710 kids under the age of 10 um, and is doing it alone. Um, Gail, and then her replacement will also have close to 650, 660 students in four through six. Um, that is, I would say, well above industry norm. And so, you know, in future budgets, we may be recommending that we might have to bring back some type of assistant principal to handle the, the workload um, that is associated with the sheer volume of students. So keep that in mind. And we should also be clear that we're also not planning to reinstate the uh, gifted program at the elementary school that was eliminated as part of the budget cuts, but similar to the libraries, we're undergoing a process to evaluate what's best for students in that capacity. Is that right? Right. So what, what we're doing is, um, as Mr. Sullivan referenced, we have some staff for additional growth. Um, if that growth does not materialize, we, we would have that conversation as a board to see if we wanted to um, reinstate the program as we, as Mr. Burnett articulated it in the last meeting, more of a push-in model for support and enrichment um, that would be utilized to support a broader uh, group of students, not just a small uh, segment of our population, but really focus our, our efforts on a larger group. Um, so we still have that flexibility, um, but right now I wasn't comfortable adding it back in with the lack of clarity on the budget and uh, not knowing necessarily where our um, enrollment growth would come in over the summer. I just didn't feel like I could recommend it at that time. So could it happen over the summer? It could. If the board desires it. And, right. and I mean, yes. but it is a possibility that we yes. can still hire somebody Correct. in yes. July. And as we learn more about the enrollment changes and we figure out final enrollment for the fall, as well as hopefully do some more work internally to understand what the best model and capacity is for that position. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the plan for the libraries, and we talked about that, the libraries itself, the aides would be there this year if you're undertaking a larger Yes. So what we're, study that. what we're going to do do is engage um, several of the people that came and spoke in, in public comment um, to look at the long-term use of the library spaces. Uh, I think that, that the timing is perfect with the portrait of a graduate that will be um, unveiled in August, as well as some of the work that we're doing around project-based learning, design thinking, STEAM, STEM, uh, maker spaces, all those types of uh, opportunities that we present to our students, I think there's an opportunity to think about that space as well. Um, and, and obviously with the goal of always having a print-rich environment for our students to have access to a variety of texts um, to support their learning. Do you expect to do that over the next year? Yes, <coughs> over the next year. I, I would like to have that study completed and make a recommendation by April of next year so that if we were going to go out and hire um, a position to fill that role, that we would have that opportunity. Okay, so you look at the revenue side, obviously by 2022 we're going to have a very different revenue picture for the district because of the income tax. You can see that by 2022, at which point the tax will be fully phased in, um, we're anticipating it will generate about 15% of the revenue, of the operating revenue in the district. Um, property taxes are declining from a combination of the income tax growing and also because we are moving 2.75 mills that have been in the operating budget and we're going to be dedicating that to capital. Um, our state aid, again, is declining not yet as a percentage, mostly because we're anticipating it growing at a very slow rate if at all, well, the other areas are growing at a faster rate, so it becomes a smaller percentage of the overall fund. And Mike, to be clear, that state aid is based on where the budget is currently. Good, good, good change of... Are you allowed to have I'm not looking at this side. That is that the Brian shaking his yeah. head. Um, it's based on what we know now. It's, it, in place now. it's not even based on what we know now. It is based, you know, and I, I actually have, you know, 
got the slide in a minute or two that explains it. Okay. Can I wait till then to address that? Keep me in suspense. Yes. I'm going. <laughs> um, so, no energy changes in the property tax base from what we had talked about back in October. Um, yeah, we talked about the movement of the 2.75, the impact there. Obviously, the new income tax is in the forecast now. Um, what we are forecasting for pay to participate uh, based on Mr. Brown's recommendations is that, and the, you know, what seemed to be the center of the board in our discussions over the last couple of months is that pay to participate would be eliminated at the end of this school year, um, but we would increase the general activity fee in the high school from $75 to $100 to offset some of the costs of um, elimination of the pay to participate. Okay, now Mr. JC gets to your question. Before you go to that, there are two items associated with that last slide in the action agenda, just so you're aware of that um, the elimination of pay to participate and the uh, increase in the activity fee are both separate items that you will be able to vote on. Thank you. Okay, so as I put in here, the process is in flux, which is a much milder word than I wanted. To put in here, but um, we are being we are being recorded, so I I, I went with the milder choice of words. Um, the house pass version. <laughs> I, I can do that. I know. I know, I know, I know, I know it is. I'm worried. Like See your way to life. <laughs> um, the house pass version of the budget um, adds some money that we will get in Granville, uh, but there is actually no formula. Um, the base funding is all based on what everybody got last year. And whatever you got, whatever, or well, that last year being this year. Whatever, wherever we land at the end of the year, whatever that dollar amount is, that's our base dollar amount for next year. There is added funds for um, wellness and wraparound services that are outside of the funding formula um, based on uh, poverty, number of children in poverty within the district broken into quintiles. Um, we are in the lowest quintile of number of students in poverty, which means we would get in the lowest allocation. Um, so we would get more money for that. That money would have, there's ten, a list of 10 different programs that that money could be used for, uh, but there are no supplant rules with it, meaning that if we are spending that amount of money on those programs, we can now use the new state money on that and the money we're currently spending we could use for something else. Um, the Cup Patterson work um, is ongoing. Um, it is likely going to end up in a separate standalone bill that should get introduced in the next couple days, I hope. I was hoping today, but I didn't see it. So. Yeah, I think, the, I know that Representative Patterson, when I last talked to him, um, was talking about maybe by Thursday. Oh. Um, so. Sometime this week, hopefully, that will be a standalone bill. At last count, they had 57 co-sponsors, along with two sponsors, which means there are a majority member of the House that is sponsoring the bill. That's a good thing. Um, we are still working on the Senate. Um, and yeah, the budget right now is in Senate finance. A group of us will be down there testifying uh, next Wednesday. Um, in front of the Senate Finance Committee, hoping to educate them and make a push to see if we can get the provisions um, pushed in in the Senate, um, or at least part of them to give us a shot at Conference Committee um, as we get into the latter part of next month. At this point, we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have no clear idea of what the Senate may or may not be doing. I don't know. Mr. Ryan has any idea what the Senate may be doing? No, we have not heard anything at this point. Um, I have, you know, several of us have had conversations. I had a conversation a month or so ago with Senator Hottinger just to let him, letting him know what was going on. Um, I do not know what the Senate is thinking right now um, or what they may or may not do. So with all of this in flux, um, the current forecast is assuming the current formula because I didn't know what else, I just didn't know what else to assume. Um, so it just has the current formula moving forward. Yeah, the current formula, we would be formula funded. We get some additional aid each year. If you take a look at simulations, both of the house-based plan and the Cup-Patterson work, the, there are increases in there. They're 
kind of in line with what the current formula means for us. Um, so I'm not uncomfortable using the forecast of the current formula with a concern of maybe seriously misrepresenting um, where we may end up at the end of the process. Um, that is actually the end of the presentation, which is not really an ending point. Uh, it's more a bridge to, when we get to board discussion, I'll have a couple other slides to show, to kind of get us started on the discussion of where we are with school funding. So if there are no other questions, we'll continue the discussion. That's fine. Thanks, Mike. Okay. So we're now at the uh, portion of our agenda where we welcome public comments. If anyone would like to step forward to the podium and address the board, you can state your name and address and uh, share your comment. Uh, my name is Stephanie Hauser, and I love this one. Sure. Okay. Um, I live at 329 West Elm Street. Um, and I usually buy my lunch every day at high school. And I sit with about seven other people who often buy their lunch as well. And as good as the food tastes, there's one problem that um, is becoming a lot more apparent this year. And that's the amount of hair that we find in our food. Um, I'd say about two to three times a week, me or somebody at my table will find hair baked into our food at the, in their lunch. And I think that there's a simple solution to this, and that is to have the lunch workers wear hair nets. Because right now, they just wear hats, but most of the ladies have bangs, and the hats don't cover the bangs or the hair that comes out from under, which is where I think the hair falls into. Um, so I think that would be a good idea, because um, as president of the upcoming junior class, I can speak for at least my grade when I say that finding hair in our food is kind of a common occurrence. Um, but the food does taste really great, but it's kind of hard to finish it when you find hair. Sure. So. We appreciate your sharing that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. We will address that. I'm sure Mrs. Sherburn will schedule a meeting tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry for that experience. Yeah. Anyone else? <clears throat> My name is Jim Prentice. I live at 211 Woodwood Drive. And um, I'm not. 1978 graduate of Vanderbilt High School. And the um, uh, reason I'm here is to uh, recognize uh, something that happened 50 years ago and 40 years ago. I handed uh, each of you a New Advocate article. I have bifocals, I hope you do too. <laughs> um, 50 years ago, on Saturday, May 24, 1969, uh, Jim Alexander won a state title in the two mile. Forty years ago, on Friday, May 25th, 1979, Kerry Brown won a state title, the first of two state titles, in the discus. I just kind of like to go through a little bit of the, uh, the newspaper articles. Uh, Leather-lunged Jim Alexander of Granville and sprint star Jeff Murray from West Muskingum packed away state class A championships in the Ohio track and field finals here Saturday. Alexander, a swift senior who takes special liking to distance running, took the Ohio class A honors in the two mile while Murray speeded away to a blue ribbon in the 440 yard run. Jim did run the best race of this year, Saturday, as he finished with a 9.42.7 time, but it was certainly good enough to bring home the state crown. Alexander sprinted out on the last part of the seventh lap and started the eighth lap to pull ahead of two tough competitors, Bill, Penn Bill Huntington of Grant Valley and Brady Dean of Cuyahoga Heights. Uh, Alexander's 942.7 was a bit slower than his 924.2 in the district and 927.3 in the regional. Alexander holds the Licking County records in the mile in the 880. So at the time, 924 was the, uh, um, the school record. 
and uh, the, uh, the two uh, Lincoln County records, county championship records in the mile and the 880 were in the mile, it would have been 429.2 and in the half, 202. So the two Lincoln County League records were eventually broken. Uh, the 202 in the half was broken by Lou Hammond, and the uh, mile 429.2 was eventually broken by Bill Epperson of uh, Lincoln Heights. Harry Brown. <coughs> Harry athletes participating in the annual state high school track and field championships at Ohio State University turned in some top-notch performances, although the weather wasn't so top-notch. Carrie Brown competing in the girls' class AA discus throw captured Granville's first state track title in a constant downpour of rain and biting winds that kept the temperature hovering around mid-40 degree mark for most of the day. Brown's winning effort went 122 feet 9 inches and bettering the qualifying mark of 113 feet 2 inches in the district. Brown, only a sophomore, was followed by, and I think that's pretty much the end of what when we talk about Kerry Brown. Kerry Brown won two state titles, and uh, so she won them as a sophomore and a junior. And then her senior year, she was uh, uh, beaten out by a Northridge gal, uh, Chris Yoker who also upset her at the league meet because um, Carrie had been the league champion freshman, sophomore, junior year. So it was quite an upset. Not only are you upsetting the two-time state champion, you're, you're, you're upsetting the three-time league champion. So Carrie Brown was, um, of course, I'm sure that because uh, those two probably saw each other all the time. They're probably good friends. So it was quite an accomplishment for uh, Chris Yoakum to upset probably a friend uh, at both the league meet and the state meet. As you may have noticed, uh, Jim Alexander, he did the half and a mile at the league meet. And then he, uh, when it went, postseason, he did the two mile all the way to the state. When Jim Alexander was running track and field, if you participated in the two mile, you weren't allowed to do anything else. So thus, in the league championship, you want the points. You want the guy to get some points. So thus, he was in the half and, and in the mile. Once you get into postseason, of course, he went, went for it. Uh, as a sophomore, Jim came in fifth in the mile. And uh, his junior year, uh, he won both the, uh, the half and the mile at the district level. But because he became ill between the district meet and the regional meet, he was not able to participate. Otherwise, he surely would have gone on to the state his junior year in the half of the mile, or at least the mile, or he hadn't been there, maybe the half too. So I'm sure that it was kind of uh, sweet that kind of missing out on your junior year at the state, he was able to go back and win the title. Thank you, Thank you for sharing that history. We appreciate it. And I love that the full-size Chevy Nova was only 1969. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. I think I've got a big leather lung description. Yes. <laughs> I might not use it later. Thank you. It's, uh, there's a long and great history here in Randall of track and field athletes who continue to this day to be well above the size of our small town uh, and, and state level. Thank you. For discussion, I'm tee that up.
the board discussion that we're going to talk about is dealing with school funding. I've got a couple graphics to get us started. Um, having <coughs> Representative Ryan here, um, I will invite him to join the discussion if he has so chooses or has a, if you have questions for him. Um, if, if that's okay with him. No, that's fine. Okay. Um, all of our three slides are just to sort of be, get, the, um, get this started. Um, the top left is taking a look at current state aid um, per pupil distributions across the state. Um, these are after deductions, so this only counts pupils actually going to school in the districts and is after all the deductions the district has for students leaving. Um, so it measures, what you see on this, this is a continuum of all 610 school districts. Um, you can see that we are down at $2,430 a kid is what we get in Granville. Um, you see out there the $11,999, there are, it's a little hard to read on there, there are six districts getting over $12,000 um, per pupil from the adjusting state aid loan. The graphic to the right shows our spending per pupil in Granville and the spending per pupil in the other six districts that are talked about there. And you can see that you know, in most of these districts, they're getting as much from the state as we are spending per pupil. Um, and most of our revenue, uh, you can see our spend, you know, our spending per pupil, um, or our other revenue per pupil is $3,600. Um, and so it's a lot smaller number. Um, and this is, this is a little different measure in the right because it is measuring from the cup report. So it, it, this is before all the deductions and everything because that's what they report in, in the cup report. Um, and then the bottom is, this is the bottom part of what's called the SFPR, which is our funding. Um, this is from our May number one. You can see we get a base of $6.5 million from the state, what comes off of there is $1.4 million of adjustments, $800,000 going to the ESC, um, which primarily is doing preschool, MHMD um, education, um, $224,000 going to other public schools where our students are open enrolling into, our resident students, $88,000 going to um, online community schools for the students we have attending those. And then $282,000 are the John Peterson and Autism Scholarship deductions going to the providers of those services um, to our students. And so we end up with a net of about $5.1 million um, that we are getting from the state. And that's what, that 5.1 million is kind of analogous to the 2430 that's in the top left hand um, graphic that is on there because that is a post deduction um, amount of money that's right there. So I just want to, you know, these are based on conversation that the board had um, <coughs> last month and questions that the board asked us to take a look at just to kind of tee up the discussion. Um, that the board wanted to undertake on state funds. Mike, can I ask a clarifying question? Yeah. Um, on the open enrollment adjustment, is is that based on our state share index, or is that do they get the full allocation of six thousand twenty? Twenty. Six thousand twenty per student. We get an allocation of about two thousand dollars for each of them. Even for open student. enrollment. Hmm? Even for open enrollment. Hmm? Yeah, it's the same for open enrollment as it is for community <laughs> school. It's, we get an allocation of about $2,000 for each of those kids because they're resident kids. And then 6020 is deducted from us and sent to the district where the student is attending school. You do a lot of districts where that's opposite, though. Yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, well, some. The, the, yeah. I, the ones that are getting 13000 per child right. love writing that $6,000. We take that deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, so that's, that's like 17% of our budget. Is that capacity then? 
And they're going bankrupt at the same time. And they have, they're paying the same millage as Brando. Yeah. And some, and some of their precincts more. Which, and, the, and their wealth is not what ours, you know, the average income is not the same as here. Uh, they're, they're in a no-win. I don't know how they, with that high growth they have, um, it's, and the Cup Patterson would give them, I believe, $7 million or more instantly. Or whether it's fully phased in, I should say. Yeah. But that's my biggest concern is going forward, we've patched this together. We predecessors I'll say I've patched this forward so far and I'll take some credit for the last four years, but uh, 
everybody can, to, to get your question, everybody can agree on any kind of theory, even the past moves to shake this up. This is different because it came from the treasurers and superintendents. That's what makes this, every other thing that's been tried has been a group of well-meaning people that aren't school officials. So this is a much better process. Um, but every other time, even when people would agree, that, hey, this sounds like a great idea, let's do this. It was all fine until the printouts come out of what each district gets. And again, everyone looks at, it seems like everyone looks at the district total rather than the per pupil amount. And those can be very misleading depending on enrollment changes. Um, yeah, if you don't have a whole lot more money in, you know, half the district's going to be disappointed, half of them are happy, right? Because some are going to win and some are going to lose, and you never get away from that. But like, it sounds like we've got a lot more support for this. I think just based on the logic behind it and the fact that the system's been so broken in the past. The other thing I would share is that the figure Mike shared that 57 co sponsors were up to. That's a couple more than I even heard. That's great. With the two sponsors, that's 59. That's the highest I've heard in my four years at this stage of the process. I mean, it's yes. overwhelming. Now, the Senate, though, has not really been involved, so I don't know how they're going to feel. But. And there's a lot, from what I've seen, there is a lot of misunderstanding among the senators about what's even in the House version of, um, of the, the budget that has gone over to them that I don't think a lot of them have, are fully aware of what that would do, how that would work for districts. Uh, so in that capacity, is there something that we should do or this community should be doing on the Senate side? Or I'm sure there's a lot of advocacy happening at a lot of different levels. And you know, when it's appropriate, you know, I, um, I think it's interesting. the more contact that we, <laughs> that you folks, our folks, can have with Senator <coughs> yeah, he is in leadership. He is the assistant majority whip. So he's the number four person in the Senate leadership. I think, you know, as much contact as we can have with him to advocate for the work that um, has been done in the work group it is good. Um, like I said, I had a conversation with him about six weeks ago. Um, a brief, yeah, I stopped down in his office, a brief conversation um, with him. And I think as much of that as we could do, if, if there are other senators that you know, um, yeah, as much as we can do over the next, unfortunately, we have two weeks. Right. Um, yeah, they're, they conclude, the Senate of Finance concludes hearings next Thursday. Um, it's the last day of hearings on the budget before they do their recommendations um, for the full committee and then to send them to the Senate board. Mike, I, I, I was just going to if, if Cup, Cup Patterson is going to be a separate bill, is that going to go through education or what committees will it go through in the Senate? It, well, if it's a separate bill, it's going to come in the House first. Um, it'll be a House bill. Okay. Um, I think the, uh, the concept is, and I think the speaker is behind this, um, at least in the separate bill, is to have something done in the House by the end of the calendar year. I think is the hope. Um, I presume it will go mostly through House Finance, because um, it's really more of a funding bill than it is um, an education policy bill. So I guess it will spend more time going through, you know, the subcommittee, which is, of course co-chaired by Colin Patterson, um, and then move its way, through, I would presume, through the full House uh, Finance Committee. Candidly, I would just say something this magnitude going in at this point into the Senate, I don't think the chances are very good. But it doesn't mean we can't try. And also trying will help prime the pump for the same little bill that clearly already has enough votes to pass the House. Um, and I believe the implementation there would be to have it take effect in the second year of this budget. Um, so we would lose out on a year, but that's better than Brent two. One of the things that during the last or most recent levy campaign is, you know, people saying, you know, what are we doing? How are we influencing, you know, state policy? And, and the reality is, people need to get engaged. Um, our our parents need to, you know, talk a little bit about the scenario in Granville and say, you know, here are our thoughts, and, and organize and connect with with the legislature. 
Um, and now's the time. Now's the time to do that. So, uh, you know, I know that when Craig McDonald comes to my office later this week, we're going to be sharing that information, uh, hopefully empowering people to, to contact, contact their their senator and uh, and share their opinions. Because I think that's what is powerful when your constituency says, "Hey, something needs to change." What do you forecast under if Cub Patterson passes? When? Taking when Cub Patterson passes, thank you. Uh, taking that per people spending metric that we talked about, which I think is the right way to look at this, the only way we should look at this is how does that change from the, you know, the from that chart you're showing us? Um, honestly, for us, I would suspect it will not change significantly. We, you know, we are a wealthy school district. Um, and we will be a wealthy school district regardless of what funding system is, play, is in place. I think what is important is that it, it, if it's a fully functional, fully funded system, when we do add kids, we will get more money for those kids. But you know, we don't see it as much because our growth is not as rapid as Looking Heights or Olin Tangy. Especially I was doing some work a couple of weeks ago. All in Tangier actually gets less aid per pupil now than they did 10 years ago from the state because their, their student population is growing faster than their state aid is growing. So they are actually getting less from the state today than they were 10 years ago. Um, and but the, whether it's them or whether it's us, if we continue to grow students, under this program, we will get funded um, for those students, so we at least will not be falling further behind where we're taking on students and it's up to our taxpayers to pay 100% of the cost of the additional students. And I think that's a key selling point of this. The other thing is also, a, you can explain how the funding is happening. Um, which is really hard to do right now. Um, the other thing is that as there are studies going on looking at dealing with students who are economically disadvantaged or um, students with special needs, when you have a clearly defined um, spending structure um, like we've built, you can, you can actually influence and change something and know what you're changing. Um, you can say, yeah, you can say if we need more services for mental health and, and wellness and wraparound services, there's a line in the in the formula for mental health and wraparound services, you can put more money into it. If you know, if you again, you know, it doesn't matter which one you pick, um, but in any of these areas, you can fund you know exactly what you're funding. You know, in, in the system that we have right now, you to some to make some changes. There's no idea how you even attack those, other than what has happened in the governor and the house, and it's all being done outside the formula because there's no way to fix the formula to get it to do it. And so now we're moving to you know proposed to be moving to the system with no formula and additional funding outside the outside the formula. Um, which the first longer that goes on, the more difficult it becomes to actually get to a formula. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw that in 2014 um, when there was a move to a formula after we essentially had four consecutive years of no formula and the amount of dislocation um, that we saw after four years of no formula was, was awful. You never get out of that hole. No, we're still, we're still in that hole. Um, that's where caps came from, is because you know you, you take some of the district like Licking Heights, Earl, and Tangy, who got no additional funding for four years for all the students they were adding, and now all of a sudden you come up with, try and come up with a formula that funds them, and you look at the amount of money, and this is what happened: you look at the amount of money it would said they need to do that, and people said we can't do that. We yeah we can't give that much money to one to one district or two districts. And then we ended up, now we have 100 and 
60 some districts that are capped by something like $500 million that are not getting the funding that the formula says they should be getting. Way to run a business. <laughs> Just to illustrate the, where we are, the last two budget cycles that I've been involved with, we have put an extra one billion with a B total, the two budgets together, all over and above what the governor's has in reduced budget. And I mean, statewide, I don't hear anybody saying, "Yeah, we're great." I mean, it, it's so. And, and, and the lack of I've, I've had when I last cycle, I was vice chair of the finance committee and would have members of the General Assembly come from, the, there's some areas that have some real struggles that, that need some of this money we're talking about sure. that comes from here, quite frankly, and I, I certainly understand that. Um, but some of those folks would come to me with, here's what we need for my district, can you do this to the school funding? So when we would actually run the numbers and do what they asked for, there were so many triggers and so many mandates, they would actually get less money than they were getting without making the change that their district had proposed to help themselves. I mean, that's how, yeah messed up we are, and, and, and I don't think we got here out of ill intentions. Right. It, my concern is if we don't do this now, there, there is a certain percentage of the legislature already that is much more of a, hey, if we just give everybody a little bit more every year, they'll be quiet and it'll be okay. But that's the easiest way because we can't fix the, like they've already given up basically is what I'm saying. We'll just keep putting a little more money in it and, and I don't believe that. This, this process was, Phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you, Scott. I know that you uh, you were an integral part of what brought Cup Patterson to this point. Uh, we call Cup Patterson around her soul. But, <laughs> but I know that, uh, I, I know that that you've been a key leader in moving that along and, and positioning it where it is. And, and I'm encouraged at least by the fact that there are 57 or 59 members who are supporting this, and, and I recognize that there's been additional money put in the budget in the last couple of years, but, but you know, your, your point is correct, which is if we don't fix the system and put it on the right path now and put in a funding program that everybody understands and, and can rely on, then it, it puts all of us, from the state on down to local officials and local school districts, in a possible situation where we're asking our communities to fund something and we don't know how it works. We don't know how it gets paid. And, and you know, even if more money goes in the top every year, there's still so many holes in that bucket before the money flows down to the districts like us that doesn't result in anything tangible for us. It just puts greater pressure on people. So I, I encourage you and appreciate what you're doing. Um, and I think we all talking to folks that we know about encouraging the Senate to take, to take action on this. The you know, bigger picture is in the long run. One of the concerns I have and have long had is that we saw some of this in the, the data that I put up earlier. You know, all that money goes into that funding bucket and then and then there are a bunch of holes in the bottom of that bucket. They, they go out to special needs, they go out to online schools, they go out to other areas. And Honestly, I think as a secondary issue, after we get Cup Patterson, if we begin to look at that and apply some standards that are consistent across the board about how that money is spent, I don't think you can hear an argument from anyone here that there are districts, disadvantaged districts, and disadvantaged students in the state, and more money is required to try and put them on, on a better footing. And I think it, it serves all of our interests in the state make sure that we're producing graduates on a statewide basis that are, that are prepared and ready to compete. I don't have an issue with that. The difference between what, what we get from the state and what other districts, high need districts get from the state, you don't see it narrowed, but you don't have any expectation that's going to be eliminated or should be. But I think there's other monies that get diverted, in my words, from that, from that bucket, that bucket uh, of money that can come to other districts and ultimately like to, to districts like ours, they get diverted into ways that, you know, we caught some extreme, or I hope it's an extreme, you know, example. Maybe it's not. I don't know. I don't know what any of us know. But, um, but certainly I would love to see some effort to 
to address that issue that those other holes in the bucket the money's going out that is maybe unaccounted for and certainly um, would be you know, better directed to the, to the local folks who are paying taxes or to support the packages. That's a longer term issue I understand. Can I have one more thing uh, uh, on the on the disparity of what's going to different districts, I do initially this this would be re refreshing from a legislator's point of view if a district like Granville advocated for what I'm going to say next, because typically we get folks asking for, and, and this would help Granville in the long term, but in the short term it wouldn't do a thing for us. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe we could possibly narrow that delta, that extra going into some of the at the high need districts if we invested a little more in their three and four year olds to get them to the starting line on time um, uh, based upon need if we really attack that there's still going to be a delta between granville and a, and a district that, that doesn't have a focus on education like we that, that's just it's but i believe that asking those kids that face all these social challenges and safety challenges i mean you name it i've, I've learned a lot since i've been over there about other places and it, it's they're, they're a very diverse state um, but to expect a child that is already two years, say, behind, if not more, to somehow catch up through a 13-year span of K through 12, which is what we're doing now, and our spending on those children ranges, again, from what, 400 Nolan Kennedy-ish to 13,000 or something range per child for 13 years, my thought is if we really target two years get them to the starting line time, we're still going to spend more on those districts. But I believe most districts will, I believe in our public schools, that they will pull them through 12 years of schooling in an adequate fashion, and that delta could be narrowed, that long term would help what we're right. faced with here. Right. But, so if you can work that in, so if your conversation gets that involved, I think it would be refreshing from the other point of view, somebody that listens to those calls, to hear a little more long range, um, you know, our cycle over there are two years, so everything is, there's, that's part of how we are where we are. It's hard to have long range planning when you live in a short term cycle. So, sorry. No, 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 that's great. That's great consistent insight. with what great we do here. And that's, that's great insight. I mean, ultimately, we all want the same thing, which is for the state to produce <coughs> graduates who. Um, where the money then leaves 
either. No. So that's a big plus for us. That is a big plus for I think all of us. Yeah, and because again, that's a piece that we can't forecast. I mean, it's, a, it's an unknown. We, we always talk about the total. Yeah, and the total cost, but um, in our forecast, so that's I think that's a big, yeah. big bonus. Um, yes, it helps us quite a bit. You don't necessarily get more money, but you know we are um, not putting out. It makes it more stable. It's a more yeah. it's a more stable forecasting yeah. environment. Possible, but that wouldn't help all the kids who need help. So eventually, my daughter in fifth grade took the idea to her social studies teacher and gave a presentation to her class, and she made up um, handouts saying, "Support school funding. This is what you can do," and write your legislators was one of those things. And she felt strongly that everybody needed to do something. And and I love that she understood that it was not to benefit her, it was that all kids should have the opportunity that she has. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anything else on that? So before we move off of board discussions, we'll point of personal privilege. You did a great job. I want to make sure the board has an opportunity to put anything it wants. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'll start. Um, Mike, we, we say thank you, and you know, I thank the public for, for what you've done for your service. Thank you's not enough. Um, yeah, I've always thought that among the most important things that, that the boards of education do are uh, set policy and standards for we want to conduct our business and what we want our students to be able to achieve. Manage our budget and be good stewards of public resources, their funds that we're, uh, we're entrusted with. Um, and to, to um, be advocates for education on a broad level. And, um, and to me, the most important thing we do is hire a superintendent or a treasurer to enact what we call it. Extraordinarily fortunate in Granville now, and you and Mr. Brown, people who epitomize those objectives. And, and what you've done in terms of tirelessly advocating at the state level and, and so effectively because of your, as Jeff said, you have the technical skills that are unparalleled in the state, and you have the ability to explain it to fools like me uh, and let people understand. Uh, you have credibility when you walk in and talk to people about this, but you know it, you understand it, you see the issues. Uh, you do those things so well. You clearly managed our budget in an extraordinary fashion. We receive the highest audits every year from the state auditor for the work you and your team do. Uh, you've got 
guided us through some challenging funding times and, and really been instrumental in helping put this school district and this community on a solid financial foundation for years to come. And then top it all off, going in the classroom to teach, which no one expects you know, a treasurer in the state of Ohio. And you epitomize your commitment to kids in this community by going and doing that and giving them your time, your experience, your expertise in a way that is, is, is so invaluable to them. And so I'm just extraordinarily grateful for what you've done for the school district, for this community, for all of us personally. You have been uh, a terrific partner, terrific colleague, a terrific friend, a great leader. And I thank you for all of that. I wish you well in everything you do, and I hope that we'll continue to benefit from your expertise and your involvement. Uh, but uh, it's, as I say, thank you is just not enough for all you've done for us. Thank you. It, it, uh, you know, I, I absolutely echo the things that you said, and I, I really appreciate your contributions here and your contributions to the state. But during our treasure interview process, it was really insightful for me that it wasn't just like Granville and even at the state level after there were so many individual districts whose treasurers were truly grateful for the insight that you were able to bring them through the models that you created and when you proliferated that amongst so many school districts. Because there are school districts all over the state that are struggling with understanding these models and how they can forecast effectively so they can staff, right? So they can create programs and things like that. And I think each and every one of the treasures that we had, you know, certainly knew of you and most of them clearly benefited and all the students in all those districts really benefited from the work that you've done. And I'm really proud that we've been able to support you and give you the latitude to make that happen through your time here at Granville. So there's so much you've done across the street and for so many kids, thank you. Thank you. Never let your niece and Thomas go first. <laughs> <laughs> you can always say they don't. <laughs> no, but they have really expressed, you know, a lot of, you know, what we are all grateful for. So I'm not going to be worried. Uh, but I do also thank you for keeping my senior engaged for the last two weeks. <laughs> He's been. It's been his favorite project. So you know, to you know, he really enjoyed um, being involved in that. And, I really look forward to the testimony earlier today. So. And he did a very good job. It's kind of up his alley. So, yeah. I, mean, I, I can't top what Russ said, but I, I personally want to thank you as the newbie. I hope you've prepared Brittany about my constant asking of questions. <laughs> and they might be silly and crazy, but. Um, You've, you've really helped me a lot personally, kind of get caught up with, with my colleagues who have, have a lot of experience with this, and I don't. And you've been a tremendous help and very patient with me, and I appreciate that. And to echo what Thomas said, uh, a couple of the uh, other candidates called you a rock star, <laughs> <laughs> which gave me all kinds of crazy yeah. <laughs> of our treasure being a rock star. But I thought I thought that was I thought that was a but I thought it was a great I, seriously the compliments and the impact you've had not only on on our school district but around the state is like to like like Pippin said is is amazing and we really blessed by that and can't thank you enough for everything you've done for our community. Yeah. <laughs> 
I, I think it's important. It's it's a family job. It really is. And so um, they and Hannah helped us on the Levy campaign. So you know there are a lot of nights that you're not at home, and so it's always important to recognize the rest of the family. But he does a really good thing. He sends them on vacation without him. <laughs> and I yeah, think they really enjoy it. <laughs> but yeah, that's why no one is here. They're all in Italy right now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. But yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we'll close the board discussion and move to the action agenda. Scott, both I know you may have to leave, but thank you for yeah. all that you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. We are very grateful to you. Appreciate all your efforts. And, uh, I encourage you to keep going and we'll do what we can to support. Thank you. Great. Item 10.01 is the 2018-2019 list of corrections. Uh, we, on May 26th, hope to graduate 200 students, roughly. Yeah, 200. Well, senior e uh, exams are tomorrow. <laughs> so if they don't show up, or uh, you never know. So. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, anybody going to vote no one? <laughs> you know about what? Yes, one stuff. That's right. We stick to the wall. Ms. Deeds? Aye. Dr. Corman? Yes. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Wolf? Aye. Mr. Jennings? Aye. Thank you. Item 2 point, or 10 point 02 is school fees for the 1920 school year. Some of the Second. As requested, um, the administration went through a process to look at the school fees and have adjusted where possible. Um, I think the majority of the adjustment occurred at the high school level um, in bringing some of the items that were current, or in the school fees in the past into the building budget. Um, so I think that's a good exercise to go through on an annual basis. Malice to it, we tend to get creep every year, and, and we have a few things here and there, things that we need. And so, I think it's good to revisit that uh, and make sure that we're not assessing fees for things that really ought to be part of our annual budget. And I think it also it, it gives us a better idea of cost control if it's in our annual budget as opposed to something that's outside the budget that we're not aware of. I encourage you to keep doing that. And, and also, you know, later in the agenda, we have a action item around the activity fee increase, right? In reality, there's this uh, offset to partially for that to some extent, right? And we're reallocating where appropriate, right? And allocating the activity fee where it's, it's due, and, and the school fees, you know, adjusting those as well to make sure that they're only as necessary. Mr. Miller. Hi. Mr. Wolf. Hi. Ms. D. Dr. Gorman? Aye. Mr. Janice? Aye. Uh, 10.03 is the elimination of the participant. So move. Second. Nothing further to add? Um, okay. I think it's the right result. We, you know, a year ago when the, the initial levy didn't pass, we needed to do some things to try and plug some holes in our budget bucket. Far we've not seen that, but I know we're concerned with that long-term impact. And so, uh, we supported us with the last levy. I think this is something we can do, and still be, remain very fiscally responsible, and, uh, and make sure that students are being unfairly burdened, or a segment of students are being unfairly burdened. So, I'm glad for joining us. Yeah, I look at it as you know we value all of our extracurricular activities. Um, and I feel like getting rid of pay to participate for athletics, and you know, it just sort of equals things out and really puts the value, you know, across the board. And you know, the next item will increase it just to try to offset that. But I think that it's a model that you know we don't value one thing over the other just because you know we can levy a fee on some things but not on other things. So I think this allows us to, to keep 
level the playing field across all of our extracurricular activities. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Dr. Cornman. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Okay, the next item is 10.04, the GHS student activity increase. So moved. Second. That's the $25 uh, fee increase from 75 to 100. Impacting all students equally. Impacting all students equally. Comments? Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. I'm actually going to remove 10.05 from the agenda. Um, I don't believe that that's uh, ready yet um, in its final state, so I'm going to remove that. 10.05 uh, is the approval of the job description, uh, which is the technology integration specialist. Okay, so. Uh, Evan was in the position of Applications Coordinator. Um, we're changing the name slightly to Innovation or Technology Integration Specialist, um, but we have moved a lot of um, the items that were more tech-oriented from a hard boxes and wires fix standpoint off that um, job description, and that is going to be absorbed by Mr. Thompson and Mr. Welker and Evan is going to be prioritizing the integration side of the equation. Oh, not Evan. His replacement will be um, focusing more on the uh, technology integration side of the equation, as well as um, this will now be part of the collective, collective bargaining agreement because he used to be an exemplar. So helping the users you will use the use technology, the technology. effectively. Yep. Technology integration coordinator or specialist? Specialist. Oh, the job description is coordinator. Yeah. Uh, it's it is coordinator. coordinator. Sorry. Yeah, part of the role will be to um, help the coaches at both the elementary and the intermediate as well. So they are going to be tech integration across the entire district, if you want to think of it, specifically at the middle school, high school. But then they'll also supplement or help us with our professional development, um, basically directing the coaches at the other two buildings. So that's why we're trying to steer it back towards the integration role, make it essentially more of a teaching role, and take all the networking and server stuff, um, details out of it so that they can focus on the classroom. He did a much better job of explaining. <laughs> that's why it's his profession. <laughs> Questions? Dr. Corman? Aye. Mr. Wolf? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Ms. Deeds? Aye. Mr. Janice? Aye. 10.07 is our uh, OSBA web based update service, which is related to our board policies. Second. They host our board policies on our website. This is just our annual. Ms. Dates. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Okay, 10.08 is the Alliance for High Quality Education dues. Second. And those dues are the same as they were last year. Most of you attended the Alliance luncheon during the Capital Conference. You understand the work that we do. Um, advocating on some of the more academic side of the equation, graduation requirements um, versus the funding, but we also dabble in that as well. And they've been supportive of the Cup Patterson work group. Um, obviously, our, it's a high wealth, high capacity school districts that are in the alliance. And we get value out of that. Yeah. I'm currently serving as the vice chair, have no desire to chair. <laughs> <laughs> step back when they take roll. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Any questions? Ms. Deeds? Aye. 
Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Cornwell. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Uh, 10.09 is the GHS and GMS roofing contracts. Second. So we are going to be uh, replacing parts of the roof of GHS and GMS with Duralast. Which is what? A roofing material. <laughs> 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 that lasts. It's durable and it lasts a long time. Duro lasts. Well, you said it like you should know what it is. Yeah. Uh, that will all be done this summer. That's correct. Do we do we have a sense of? Uh, again, we're not talking about replacing the entire roof, but um, a sense of what the life expectancy is for those roofs going forward. Because you, usually, the the replacements are between a twenty and thirty year replacement. So, um, and I'm looking back in time to make sure my numbers are accurate. Twenty to thirty years, um, but it's not a total replacement. Right. Segments. Percentage of the roof, it varies. Uh, I would say 20% of the middle school, less than that for the high school.
and all this is being bought either off state term contract or with um, a several bid informal bidding process. Yeah, it's, um, it's not really exciting stuff that people are going <laughs> to see every day, right? But it's a half a million dollars, right? And it's a half million dollars we haven't been able to spend in the past that's contributed to leaks and flat tires in the parking lot and bad control of HVAC, which doesn't help our education and things like that. So like, I wish we could celebrate it better, right? Because it's really important stuff. But it's unfortunately going to go largely unnoticed, right? But it's really important. And even though it's hard to spend that much money, you know, we know that this is what needs to happen. And it's really great to be back on a plan and to have a capital plan that we can manage over time, right? To be able to do the right things that ultimately helps the facilities last longer. Right, because we don't want to be building new buildings, right? And putting up new facilities and things like that. And so we have to take care of the ones that we have. And it feels great that the community has supported us, and this is a big part, of it, right? Why did they did so we could we could have good safe and run for new buildings? Yeah. Well, and I I like what Mr. Miller said. It's it's hopefully this is putting us back on track where we need to be. Mm -hmm. That the district's been talking about for a long time. So this just isn't some brand new no. expenditures from the district because we're flush with cash all of a sudden. These are things that have been um, needed to be addressed for a long time. Um, and and I, I do like how we're, we're breaking it out specifically, Tim. I think that's, for those that look, we can, we can say, this is what we're doing. So I think it's, I think it's great. Ms. Davies. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Celebrating the, no, sorry. Yes, aye. <laughs> 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 the elementary school, which we have a little bit of trouble climate controlling right now. Uh, that takes us to the consent agenda 11.01A through C11. So moved. Second. Okay, so I'd like to call your attention to a few items. Uh, obviously, we have the Ed Granville Education Foundation grant recipients listed. Um, we have a donation of a ladder for the roof at the Granville High School, valued at five thousand dollars from AWS. Um, it's actually they are donating it because the ladder that was up there was in such bad condition that they didn't want their employees walking on it anymore. So it was really um, self defense. Self -defense. <laughs> that is a great way of stating it. Um, yeah, preservation. And then the, uh, the final thing that I would call your attention to is the resolution of the stadium naming rights. Um, and that, that is basically an authorization for Mr. Uh, Janice and I to um, sign a, a future naming right agreement with a uh, potential foundation. Um, under certified contracts, I will call your attention to obviously the number of uh, people on that list, but we have one of them in the audience. So Josh Duvall is back there, wave at everyone. He is going to be, once you approve this item, our new athletic director. And he is coming to us from uh, Westerville South with a great recommendation. I know John Kellogg really well. He spoke very highly of Josh's influence there, so uh, we're very excited for him to jump in and get engaged in the athletic program and take our athletic program to new heights. So, welcome. Well, well, yeah. um, and then we have our annual contract renewals for certified and classified, so our one, two, three, and continuing contracts, and our continuing, con or, uh, continuing contracts for classified. Um, and then um, we have a couple of these of that. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. He does a fantastic job, and that is um, really to also help out Samantha Schnabel at the high school um, so that she has the ability to have the impact that we want her to have and focus her energy. And, uh, thanks to the music boosters for sustaining his position through this 
past year, right, as a way to bridge us to when the community was able to support themselves. Thank you. And others.
Um, so ignore what they sent us two weeks ago. Um, and then last week they sent us a revision that said that of the $25,000 they took away, they gave us back $32,800 of the twenty-five they took away. Um, which, honestly, we, at this point, because we've changed our spending, silly us. <laughs> we can't even get it all spent this year, so it'll, there'll be about three or four thousand dollars that we will carry over um, to next year. So, all this is doing is the appropriation is bringing the three federal funds back in line with what I hope is our last um, version of this for the year, since it's now getting the point they shouldn't be able to change it anymore. Um, I will make no promises. Mm -hmm. You won't change it. No. I'm not going to change it. I don't, I don't think Brittany's going to change it yet either, unless the state yet again changes our allocation, which I do not think they will do again at this point. I think we approve it before they change it again. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also so they can change it one more time. Well, we're, we're debating whether to wait to do this in May or wait till June just in case. <laughs> Questions? Ms. Miller. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Um, 12.04 is the annual resolution authorizing us to make the payments in lieu of transportation. Second. Um, you will remember, I believe, it was in December um, that we declared transportation to be impractical to Marburg Academy and to Grace Christian School, which is in Black Lake, we are required by state law to transport any student who goes to school who's a resident anywhere within 30 minutes. Um, those two facilities are within 30 minutes. Um, we got the applications from those parents who are sending their students to there, and this is to authorize us to make the year-end payment to reimburse them for uh, their transportation costs. Um, the state does not fund us for this anymore. They used to. Uh, they do not. Up until up until last year, they we that was part of our transportation funding. It's still part of our transportation requirement, but not part of our funding. It's a finite amount. It is. It's a, it's a there's a maximum amount. It's it is not a huge expenditure. Um, it's I'm not sure. It's like eighty percent. I looked it up. Okay. It's about eighty percent last off. year. Yeah. Yeah, I think it might be a little bit less than this year. I think there's one or two students who were going to Marburg last year. I think one has moved, and I think one or two have come back to the district. I'm sure there's not quite as many kids in the room that we have to pay to transport. Ms. Davis. Aye. Ms. Wilder. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Mr. Junior. Aye. 12.05 is the approval to place the renewal of the Granville Libraries. Um, one mill levy on the valve, operating levy on the November valve. So moved. Second. Second. Basically. Very sorry we kept you waiting for a whole day. Yeah. 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 Totally worth it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I told her that she could come later. It was going to take a while to get to. We went to pressure. Um, pressure. So this is the second step. Again, we're required to do this under law. Um, we final will. Step. Mm -hmm. Final step. Final step, yeah. Second and final step, yes. Um, we will take the paperwork down to the Board of Elections tomorrow um, to follow on their behalf. I don't know if you, either of you have anything you want to add? Um, no, just that I guess um, you. If, if you get discussion points that might be worth saying is this is a straight renewal, no new taxes, no new amount of tax. Um, good stewardship of the library has been the reason we've been able to, because our funding, just like yours, is kind of messed up. Um, and it's flat, so every new person that moves into Granville, I don't get any more money to help serve them. So um, it is good stewardship that's, that's allowing us to stay the same um, with our levy. So and it, it is 40% of our funding. So um, we would have to make some very serious drastic changes if we did not have, have this nice agreement with the, with the Board of Education. So we appreciate it. We appreciate what you do. Thanks. Questions? Mr. Miller? Aye. Dr. Corman? Aye. Mr. Wolf? Aye. Ms. Deans? Aye. Mr. Janine? Aye.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.